Hello, and welcome to today's noon conference co-presented by MRI Online and AAWR. The AAWR was founded in 1981 to provide a forum for issues unique to women in radiology, radiation oncology, and related professions. The association sponsors programs that promote opportunities for women and facilitates networking among members and other professionals. They have membership opportunities for those who have completed their training, members in training, and international radiologists. Learn more about their mission and membership at aawr.org. We're thrilled to partner with AWR on these lectures as part of our shared commitment to advancing and supporting women in radiology and transforming the way radiologists learn and thrive. Today, we are honored to welcome Dr. Bashak Dewan for a lecture entitled AI at the Heart of Breast Imaging, Innovations and Insights. Dr. Dewan is a clinical professor of radiology and Eugene B. P. Frankel Endowed Scholar in Clinical Medicine at UT Southwestern Medical Center where she serves as a member of its breast imaging division and the director of breast imaging research. She earned her med medical degree in Ankara, Turkey and completed her residency training in diagnostic radiology at Ankara University Medical School, followed by breast imaging fellowship at University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. At the end of the lecture, please join her in a Q&A session where she will address questions you may have on today's topic. Please remember to use the Q&A feature to submit your questions so we can get to as many as we can before our time is up. With that, we are ready to begin today's lecture. Dr. Juan, please take it from here. Thank you very much for hosting me to share my perspective on artificial intelligence and breast imaging. Where are we now and where are we going? I hope we will have a robust discussion after, after the talk. All right, so... These are my disclosures for this talk. I'm going to start with uh, a brief timeline of how we came to be where we were at in uh, breast imaging. Um, so AI was actually born uh, back in 1956 in Dartmouth College, and the initial attempts at computer-based uh, image analysis dates back to 1960s. And um, very quickly, uh, development of CAD for mammography started in 1980s and 90s, and in 1998, FDA approved CAD for mammography, uh, which was R2 image checker at the time. And then um, early on, the studies suggested that this CAD improved cancer detection rates by 2 to 10 percent, so they were very promising. But later, down the line, uh, subsequent data emerged suggesting that CAD is maybe not that helpful in clinical practice. Parallel to that, we had um, development of uh, first applications of convoluted neural networks to mammography, which first uh, focused on mass identification. And later on in uh, late 2000s and early 2010s, advanced methodology and uh, availability of especially digital mammography and hardware led to renewed interest in um, CNN architectures and deep learning. And over the past decade, really the application of deep learning to detection and diagnosis tasks in mammography and other breast imaging modalities absolutely exploded. Uh, this includes segmentation, lesion identification, and classification of uh, masses and microcalcifications in addition to uh, breast cancer risk prediction of patients and density determination. And uh, one of the key uh, events in this timeline is the Dream Challenge, which occurred uh, in 2016-2017. And the front runners really led the artificial intelligence applications and mammography. And uh, since uh, late 2010s, Multiple studies now suggest that deep learning can enhance the diagnostic accuracy. So when we say uh, AI, there's so many uses. I mean, it's infiltrated our lives in so many ways. Uh, when you're scrolling an internet, um, if you click on different um, areas of interest, you will see that uh, the ads actually start showing you what uh, you're interested in. And you know that's really AI at work, just trying to determine your areas of interest. When you're in Netflix, it will show you, um, you know, your the, the movies that you were interested in in the past. It'll show you more of that. So, um, 
this actually goes to uh, different aspects of breast imaging in terms of appointment scheduling, invite coordination, dose regulation, image positioning, and quality assurance. But today, uh, I just want to focus on narrow AI, which is detection, diagnosis, triage, segmentation, treatment response prediction, and risk prediction, which are really tasks related to uh, what we radiologists do in our daily lives. Um, a little bit on te technical terms of uh, artificial intelligence uh, terminology. Machine learning, uh, you may have heard this before. Um, machine learning are models that, that derive parameters through being trained by existing data, meaning we're showing the computer what to find. And this was essentially what conventional CAD was based on. Um, you provide an input and then it's basically starts to try to find that input in uh, subsequent uh, images. Artificial neural networks or is, is a model framework which consists of interconnected units or neurons organized into different layers. So there's um, prioritization of certain information over others. For example, um, patients over the age of 40 are more likely to develop breast cancer. So um, and ANN may actually prioritize patient age over other findings that it may find on the image. Deep learning refers to uh, these artificial neural networks that features multiple intermediate or hidden layers that we don't necessarily teach the, um, the, uh, the computer. So uh, the most widely used uh, deep learning architecture for image classification operating by passing filters over an input to extract these higher order features that are highly predictive of what we're looking for is called convolutional neural networks. So, um, so these are the different types of AI that uh, we use or that are tested in breast imaging. Um, so I've been practicing breast imaging since 2001. And you know, since then we're not foreigners to CAD or computer-aided detection. So when I, I pressed on the CAD function, I would see something like this, the triangles um, and the, the stars here would indicate mass or asymmetries or focal asymmetries and the triangles would indicate you know, calcifications. So, uh, but there would be multiple such annotations on a mammogram, which could get sometimes very confusing. So this is an example of uh, a patient that we've seen at that time. See down there, actually, she has a mass. I circled it, but this was not even uh, found by the CAD or indicated to me to look at by the CAD. So CAD has been FDA approved since 1998. And by 2018, 92% of screening mammograms were being interpreted using CAD because there was uh, mainly because there was an additional code for it and we could bill separately for it. But despite initial optimism, the largest uh, studies uh, down the line failed to demonstrate a very significant improvement in diagnostic performance with CAD. Um, and this is uh, one of those landmark studies by um, Lehman and colleagues, which was published in JAMA that showed really um, no improvement in sensitivity, specificity, or cancer detection rate with CAD um, if you look up there, the cancers detected per 1,000 exams with CAD was 4.1 in 1,000. And without CAD, it was exactly the same. Um, and same thing with invasive cancers. There was some marginal improvement with double carcinoma in situ detected with CAD. Um, but if you look at the overall sensitivity, uh, it was 85% with CAD, 87% without CAD. And this was based on large national data provided by Breast Cancer Surveillance Consortium. Um, so it was it's pretty uh, symptomatic of what was going on nationwide. So why was that happening? The traditional CAD systems rely on detection of hand-engineered features, such, or for example, masses, uh, defined by expert knowledge. So they were delineated by radiologists at the outset. So it primarily functions as a spell checker. Uh, what does that mean? It, it, it means really we have no hope of uh, 
thinking that CAT would actually find a cancer that we haven't defined to it at the outset when it was being trained. And there was no ongoing training. In, in other words, it didn't self-train as it was seeing more and more cases. Um, well, how can deep learning uh, be beneficial here? Deep learning models learn directly from the data without the need for explicit delineation or feature engineering by the radiologist. So they have the potential to learn from features that are unseen and unknown by radiologists. So potentially they can improve the radiologist's performance. Um, and breast imaging was the poster child for that because first of all, we produced large-scale categorical outcomes. We have been using BIRATS for many decades before it was it's implemented for other um, organ systems, really. And uh, we generated a large amount of data that is um, audited every year. So we were actually recording our outcomes. So we uh, naturally became the most suitable first applicators to train, validate, and implement robust AI algorithms. Um, this is a summary of early studies of deep learning. So don't worry, I'm not gonna go over all of them, but um, just in summary, the uh, performance of even the very earliest applications of deep learning were quite successful and they were pretty close to radiologist performance. Um, I mentioned the DREAM um, trial or the DREAM challenge, which was uh, also uh, funded by IBM and lots of um, other technology uh, pioneers at the time. And uh, those were the, that's really what opened uh, the door to really wide scale application of AI. And these are the, uh, the outcomes of the DREAM challenge. There were um, three um, top contenders. Um, there were data sets submitted from both North America and Sweden, and it seemed that the, um, the performance AUC was um, pretty good overall. And when compared to single radiologists, um, this is um, KI, which is uh, Kaiser Permanente, and uh, the consensus evaluation, uh, the performances of those were uh, pretty close, not quite at the level of the radiologist performance, but they were pretty close to the radiologist. So uh, no single algorithm reached the published uh, US community radiologist average, which at the time was the benchmarks were uh, determined um, in, in a recent study. Uh, and, and But an ensemble of AI algorithms combined with a single radiologist assessment was associated with an improved overall mammography performance over a single radiologist alone. What does an ensemble of AI algorithms mean? It's a combination of um, the top performing algorithms. So it wasn't a single one, but multiple ones that was combined that uh, was able to improve a single radiologist assessment's performance. And um, in a reader study of 14 radiologists, actually they just recently showed that uh, reading with AI support increased the main AUC by 0.2% as well. So there's a marginal improvement, but a, not a huge amount of improvement for, uh, for single AI use. So um, can we actually uh, do superhuman performance? Meaning can, we, can AI alone do better than the radiologist? So um, there are different reading algorithms uh, implemented in different countries. So the settings are different in that in Europe, this, uh, they implement more uh, double reading, meaning a radiologist reads the uh, mammogram first and the recalls are overread by a second, usually a more uh, experienced radiologist. And um, most of the time they're uncalled. And in, in the USA, uh, we have a single radiologist setting. So we have to really test how this fits into these two different scenarios. So when they looked at that uh, a deep learning based ensemble alg algorithm, uh, they it did demonstrate superior sensitivity and specificity compared to the original interpreting radiologists. Uh, there was 
uh, about a 10% increase and a 5% uh, increase in specificity and a 10% increase in sensitivity in the US data. And uh, also AI outperformed radiologists with an overall increase in both sensitivity and specificity. But if you, if you look at the improvements, these were mainly in the single radiologist setting. When you look at the double radiologist setting, uh, the red dot here represents uh, the consensus reading um, and the, the um, green dot represents the single radiologist. So there was really 1% uh, improvement in specificity and 2% in sensitivity here whereas the consensus was much better than um, both the single reader and the AI here. So it depends on how we are reading it. So it seems like uh, if there's a single radiologist reading, AI will be a huge help, uh, which is relevant to us uh, practicing in the, the US. So we talked just about mammography. What about AI performance and ultrasound? Breast ultrasound received uh, less attention than mammography in the literature uh, because it's um, it's more user dependent and um, equipment dependent, and uh, you know how you scan a patient can make a huge difference in the imaging findings. But the available data suggests that DL can achieve satisfactory performance in classification of masses seen on breast ultrasound. There are fewer co uh, published comparison studies here, but um, deep learning for breast ultrasound, it looks like it may outperform the traditional CAT approach and uh, performs comparably to human radiologists. And again, these are um, the published literature on this subject as well, but I just want to focus on one really large uh, study which showed, which was a reader study of deep learning for benign versus cancer classification versus three human readers. And the deep learning uh, achieved a UC of 0.84 uh, versus 0 0.89, 89, and 0 0.79 for human readers, which was pretty much equivalent. So this could be really relevant in centers that um, do screening ultrasound for, uh, for breast cancer as a supplement. What about breast MRI? The diagnostic AI development is similarly complicated by a 3D problem space because we have multiple sequences there to think about. And the, uh, the dynamic setting, so which um, phase in the dynamic setting is the most valuable here? And do we discard the rest? So um, for that reason, most classification uh, studies have focused on the subtraction series, or the early subtraction series, and targeted classification of 2D or 3D ROIs. Um, so comparison studies are rare, but again, um, the more recent studies show that deep learning may outperform other machine learning approaches, while the results for the human comparisons are more mixed here. Um, so for example, I chose this because it's, it's uh, more representative of um, the, what's published in the literature, there is a comparison of both radiomics as well as the humans. And uh, the comparison between the deep learning radiomics and radiologists for classification of lesions on dynamic MRI, it showed that uh, deep learning outperforms the radiomics models, but not quite the radiologists. Uh, the red line here shows the radiologist's performance whereas the deep learning is at the green line. So those are two are most close to each other. And uh, the radiomics approach didn't do quite as well. So we have the data out there, but how do we actually use it in our clinical practice? So one idea is to use AI as second reader. And this one is the most popular one. Uh, AI interprets the case and then Radiologist interprets the abnormal cases, and then radiologist determines the final interpretation. This can has been shown to improve diagnostic accuracy, as I've shown before, and uh, it would translate into double reading the mammogram in resource limited settings. The other way we can use it is as a triage method. AI flags just the abnormal cases, 
Um, you can generate a work list sorted based on AI assigned priorities. I'm going to show you an example of that. And the radiologist reads cases in order of priority. And you can prioritize the negative cases if you like, or the um, highest uh, probability of malignancy cases. And um, in theory, this can improve the workflow and it can lead to a faster turnaround for critical results, especially if this is done at a mobile setting or uh, in, a, in a resource uh, scarce setting where patients have difficulty uh, coming back for their additional workups. Another way we can use AI triaging is uh, you can triage negative cases. And if you can um, trust AI sufficiently, you can actually just give them a negative report and radiologists can only read the cases flagged as abnormal. Or you can let AI read all of the cases and radiologists reviews only the abnormal or uncertain cases, which are not highly uh, ranked as abnormal. Um, there's full somewhere in between uh, 40 to 50% 40, chance of malignancy. So in both of these scenarios, uh, there's a potential to decrease the radiologist's workload and allow more time for reading positive cases and performing other duties for the radiologist. Um, so they actually tested the simulation of a deep learning triaging scenario. And they uh, this was by a homegrown model by MGH and MIT, uh, which are really, they, they produce a lot of uh, research on this on this topic on large data, and uh, in a retrospective simulation study of a triage scenario in which you basically give the patient a negative result based on just AI prediction, um, then they said, well, nineteen percent of the mammograms would have been excluded from review without compromising any diagnostic performance or missing cancers that would be otherwise detected by the radiologist. So you have 90.6% uh, uh, sensitivity with the radiologist and 90.1%. So there's a bit of a drop with sensitivity there if you are tolerant to that. Um, and uh, about the same specificity, maybe a bit uh, higher specificity. And you, know, you could basically omit reading 19% of the mammograms, which doesn't seem like a, a, a huge savings, but um, there it is. And more recently, uh, AI as a standalone mammography reader was tested in another homegrown model by uh, NYU. And then they said, well, at least 40% of true negative screens could have been read by AI with zero misses. So this is really, really promising. And it seems that the, the higher the number of exams that you actually give AI, the better the prediction uh, performance. And uh, so the question here was also, I was interested in was, um, what about the callbacks? Do we have an increase in callbacks? And there was actually um, not an increase in the callbacks by AI use, but a decrease of 20% uh, if you set the AI triaging to 30%. And in the 40% that they were presenting, there was an actual savings of the callbacks of about 30%. So this was a really, really good performing model. Um, so how do we use it in daily practice? We do have an integrated um, AI um, model in uh, mammography model in our uh, practice. And when I first log into my workstation, this is what it looks like. And it on the right, you have a case score here. These are the screening mammograms of the day. And um, there are the higher case scores. Of, I actually start looking at the higher case scores first. So you can uh, rank them the way you like it, uh, order them the way it's ranked. And you have the zeros down here. So um, for example, if um, this is for another day, you have these really high ranked uh, screening mammograms. Um, I clicked on one of those just to check uh, the case, and it seemed that it actually highlighted these segmental calcifications in the right breast 
which really I would have called back. And uh, since then, the patients had a, a, a stereotactic biopsy confirming ductal carcinoma in situ as well. So this is really helpful in getting the more abnormal cases read early on and working out the patient potentially while she's still there. So what about uh, mammograms as predictors of risk? This is actually, for me, a more uh, exciting area of uh, development because, I mean, yes, there's improvements and there's triaging available for um, for image interpretation, but we could do things, AI can actually do things that we can't do with our naked eye. So density has long been a big issue with us reading screening mammograms and um, not just because it masks cancer, but mammographic breast density is associated with over two times increased relative risk for cancer in women with extremely dense breasts. Um, and we do have automated quantitative tissue density tools that provide objective measurements that are commercially and publicly available. It's, I think we widely use it, but it's not just about quantification. There is um, density signatures in there that actually predict the patient's future breast, uh, breast cancer risk. The parenchymal complexity features, which are independently associated with breast cancer risk. This is not about the percent of breast density, but the quality or the texture of the, um, the breast density, which we can't always quantify with our naked eye. So um, this is really, really interesting because uh, it, again, the, the very productive group from MIT and MGH have come up with a, a predictive uh, model that used mammograms and they took uh, patients' traditional uh, risk uh, features, and then they fed that to the model, and then they also used the uh, the normal mammograms, and they also used um, compare that with Tyracusic version eight, which is the most common model we use to predict the patient's future breast cancer risk, and we base our uh, our decisions as to whether patient needs supplemental imaging or supplemental intense screening based on this clinical model. And they found that uh, traditional risk factors didn't do very well. Um, they were better than Tyracusic though. Tyracusic did not very well at all uh, to predict the patient's five-year breast cancer risk. But if you looked at mammograms alone, uh, it actually outperformed both Tyracusic and the traditional risk factors um, and if you actually combine those traditional risk factors with imaging, that actually performed the best. So I think this is very uh, groundbreaking uh, development in that we could do better actually at predicting which patients would benefit from uh, supplemental screening or more intense screening um, in this patient group. Um, and again, uh, you could use AI for for different reasons as well, besides that of predicting risk. So could we predict uh, the presence of extra lymph node metastasis? So this was uh, a study that used ultrasound ROI images, and you know they, they found much, much, much better prediction than what you would normally do uh, by naked eye or radiologist evaluation of traditional um, uh, values or parameters that we would use. Um, another um, clinical decision-making use for AI is uh, preoperative prediction of pathologic complete response. So her two cancers, her two positive cancers, as you know, they have a very high response rate, um, but having her two positive cancer alone could be a huge predictor of response, but that did only uh, perform with an AUC of 0 0.7, uh, but when you added that to imaging-based um, or AI-based uh, prediction and the HER2 status, it certainly improved that prediction because this is an area we're not very, very good at in, uh, in, in breast imaging, unfortunately. We also used it for prediction of axillary metastasis 
um, predicting that on breast MRI here in UT Southwestern, uh, we developed both a clinical model and an imaging-based model. And um, so you're seeing our results based on test data um, for clinical node prediction and uh, pathologic node prediction in patients who actually had surgery. And we had a pretty uh, respectable outcome with this. And more importantly, we didn't really have to look at the patient's axilla at all. These were just made based on uh, just looking at the tumor characteristics or derived from, uh, from MRI features of the tumor alone. Um, so when we looked at the, uh, on the, on the test set performance, we had a 0 0.87. Um, again, this means that it's actually applicable uh, clinically and uh, an overall um, median sensitivity of 89% and a pretty high specificity of 76%. Um, key points from that study was MRI-based hybrid model showed an improvement over the 77.6% radiologist sensitivity that we had in our institution. And we had a 55% specificity in that half of our patients actually underwent um, a, a, a biopsy, but you know, half of them actually had a positive result after that. So we were sending patients to biopsy for um, finding not a lot of cancers there. Uh, and one of the benefits of the model was scalability. So when with all AI models, really, um, if you set the specificity rate to 71%, our model yielded 91% sensitivity, which means we only missed a 9% of the metastasis. And if we had implemented our model, it would have helped avoid more than half of benign operative sentinel lymph node biopsies, which unfortunately most of the uh, invasive cancer patients have, while we were able to detect 95% of the patients with axillary metastasis. Um, so one of the concerns about using these models is, well, I mean, it performs good in your institution, but what about if I implemented in my institution, how would it do then? So we have an advantage here in uh, UT Southwestern where we are affiliated in both a tertiary care center, a university hospital and a safety net hospital. So we had collected data from both about 400 patients. And what we did was we did an exercise in which we developed the model in one uh, hospital's um, data which are completely uh, different uh, patient characteristics, even cancer age, even the types of cancers are slightly different in the safety net hospital versus the university hospital. And we were able to the performance, see that the performance of the date of the models were the same when we developed it in one and applied it to the other. And that's really what we ought to look at in all um, AI vendors that are uh, marketing their um, their product out there, how would it perform uh, not in a in a test or lab environment, but in a real life environment? So um, this is the promise, and now I'm going to shift gears and uh, explore you know what are some of the problems that we're dealing with daily um, clinical implementation. So uh, the legal re responsibility is a big one. Uh, who takes the responsibility of the decisions of the AI systems, hospital, vendor, or the radiologist, um, who would handle the disagreements between the AI and the radiologist. Um, so if I overruled a lesion flagged by AI, what would be the liability of that? And if a radiologist cannot identify a specific lesion, how will that case be managed? So if AI you know, flag something and then you work it up and then there's there's no correlate for that. So how would we go about that? Um, and the AI detected cases, um, so would they lead to more recalls for the radiologists? And that's a that's a, a real question because there's some data out there that suggests that if um, AI does detect cases and you know in a triaging environment where 
uh, radiologists are only looking at the positive cases and no negative cases, that would actually increase our callback rates, which are already under fire right now. Um, transparency and reliability are also major ones. Uh, interpretability of an AI algorithm is key in understanding how predictions are made. And some black box models are generated directly from the data by an algorithm, so we don't know how uh, the uh, AI model finds these cancers because we haven't really shown it how to find it. So it's very imperative to make model development code and testing data sets accessible to the public. And this is also one of the things we ought to look for when uh, we are looking at marketed products. There is a true concern about uh, model drift, which is a concept that is degradation of a model's prediction power due to changes in the environment over time. So it's very important to do real-time surveillance to monitor for unexpected model performances to make sure the algorithm that meets the standards and doing exactly what it's supposed to do at the outset when you we are first uh, installing them. And uh, there's now uh, uh, a recommendation by ACR to do actually um, a periodic checking on this. And this is an example comparing three commercial artificial intelligence algorithms for uh, independent assessment of screening mammograms. And you know these were done at the patient level on non-annotated mammograms. And the cancers were not localized and without insight into why AI decisions were made. So we don't actually know that the cancers reported here were actually the same ones that were um, detected down the line at diagnostic workup. There was a there was a cancer prediction done, but it wasn't. We don't know if it's the same one as the actual diagnosed cancer. It could be elsewhere in the breast, or it could be the opposite breast. So um, when vendors are touting their uh, performances, it's very important to be careful and look um, between the lines there. So approval and regulation of AI systems. Um, this is um, this is a, a developing area. Um, there's increased FDA evidentially uh, regulatory standards recently, but um, development of more improved post marketing surveillance and trials are needed. Um, currently, uh, they're regulated as software as a medical device. Um, and which means software intended to be used for one or more medical purposes that performs these purposes without being part of a hardware medical device. So that's that's just the code that they have. And uh, the concern with that is AI use adaptive algorithms that are dynamic can change in response to new information. So adaptive algorithms are very difficult to regulate in the current framework because the product initially reviewed may be different from the one the consumer ultimately encounters. So most products are actually locked after FDA um, approval is obtained. So this is good and bad. So you can actually look at the data presented to FDA and you, know, you can assume that's the same performance you're gonna get, but uh, it could be bad because there's new data that could have developed over time. And um, for example, you know, tomosynthesis or synthetic uh, mammograms. Um, so you don't know that they're doing um, as well on that new data. So because there hasn't really been an interval training on that, that algorithm. So there has been discussions about this where, you know, clinical prospective trials uh, may be needed for AI products before clearance or approval, but it, it's not in implementation at this point. Um, I'm a research director in my institution, so I always look at what are the barriers in research. Um, we need large, high quality data sets. I showed you the, the higher, the more the data, the better the algorithm uh, with accurate ground truth is needed, which, um, you know, we, I think we have a lot with mammography, but not so much with the other um, modalities. So we've got to be very careful with those. 
and uh, training data sets that are often collected from the same institution uh, and cross-validation is now mandatory in publication standards. I mean, if you go and look at uh, the majority of the uh, respectable um, journals, they, they request this now. So, um, and the cyber attacks, of course, um, you need to invest in a strong security infrastructure when we are dealing with these third party vendors. Um, there are even more biases that I wanna to touch on, which is um, bias is a big one. And there may be several biases in these algorithms that are developed. Representation is a big one. Um, FDA clearance of AI products for mammography screening did not necessarily report the race and ethnicity of the patients included. And you know, when you look at the most available training data sets used in AI development of vendors, they actually contain mostly mammograms of uh, white women. And uh, this was a very interesting study in JAMA published a few years back, and it showed that patient cohorts used to train AI algorithms in the US uh, originated mainly from three states, California, Massachusetts, and New York. So this is really important when you're looking to implement it in your own institution, if it's not representative, if your population is not representative, then um, can, you may not be, you may, it may not perform as well as uh, what's published out there. There are socioeconomic disadvantages there's missing data on disparate or socioeconomically disadvantaged populations, which may lead to underperformance of the AI in the underrepresented individuals. And this is primarily why we did that exercise in our own data, uh, in our own uh, publications with uh, lymph node metastasic prediction, uh, comparing the safety net versus um, the CUH, because we know we rotate at both sites and we knew that the patient profiles were very different. And also our resource poor communities may not be able to take advantage of AI's potential patient care benefits because they actually lack the resources to purchase these commercially available AI products. I mean, the promise is always that these uh, will actually help with the disparities and um, you know, where radiologists are not available, you can deploy them, but Really, they're being marketed, and you, you know, it's it may not be possible for resource poor communities to access these tools. Um, this is a very very interesting uh, study that I wanted to share with you. Um, I had the opportunity to actually work with one of the, um, the PIs of this study. Um, the and it is on AI recognition of patient race in medical imaging. So they actually looked at the capability of AI to predict patient race without actually giving the AI this information. And if you look at it, I mean, the AI can accurately predict race um, quite well, especially in chest X-ray. I was actually gratified to see mammography is kind of down there in the rankings, but still pretty high. Um, so that actually tells you there is a bias right there because AI can actually predict what the patient's um, race is without you realizing that it did. Um, again, uh, more implementation challenges. Translation from proof of concept to a commercially available product is a problem. I showed you a lot of homegrown uh, AI models, but um, a lot of them are not actually available for patient use at this time. And again, recognition of biases that may arise with human AI interaction. What does that mean? If AI says a mammogram is negative, I may be more inclined to call it negative and ignore a cancer that's I may have otherwise called back. Or if AI says a mammogram is uh, has cancer in it, I may actually look for something that I haven't otherwise, I wouldn't otherwise call that. And this is called automation bias. And then there is the reimbursement considerations. There's uh, currently no uh, existing CPT code for uh, AI in MAMO. There are two category three codes for quantitative analysis with ultrasound applicable to AI. So we don't know if there will be reimbursement and 
uh, if that reimbursement happens, if it's going to be a positive reimbursement or a negative reimbursement, and we can actually maybe chat more about that after um, after the lecture. And uh, incorporation into existing PACs and EMR systems requires a substantial um, infrastructure sometimes. And the real-time surveillance to monitor for unexpected model performance that may be secondary to underlying biases. Um, I don't know that a lot of institutions are prepared for this. I know that we are starting to um, do these routine audits in my institution, we're getting ready, but it's really difficult to find expertise and allocate time and um, resources to, to this to make sure that the AI is performing as it should, uh, not at the outset, but after uh, multiple years. Um, these are the training data sets available for breast imaging and AI algorithms. Again, this is really relevant uh, to the researchers out there, but whenever uh, someone tries to develop an algorithm, usually this is the first go-to uh, resource. They go to one of these, um, you know, the high number of image data sets, free data sets available, and, you know, this is where they start out. And lastly, I wanted to touch on what about the patients? What do they think? We don't have much data on um, the US population, but there was a recent Dutch population, which was published in JACR. And it interestingly said that most patients did not fully, did not support fully independent use of AI-based screening interpretation, meaning they didn't want to just get their results from uh, the computer right after they have their mammograms. About 42% uh, were opposed to the idea of using AI to select cases that require a second reading. And there was really no agreement on who would be responsible for a diagnostic error. And uh, I mean, I think if we polled the US population, I don't think we would get very, very different results, but this was what the patients thought. In closing, I want to say that AI could improve radiologist's accuracy and workload by serving as a second reader or by excluding the normal findings from human review, which could um, improve our workload. Um, it holds tremendous potential to improve the risk and prognostic prediction, which is really impressive in my opinion. However, there are various ethical, medical, legal, and logistical issues pertaining to its full implementation, which remain unsolved. And we need more high quality research, especially prospective data to see how it performs in real life setting and not just in the lab setting. Uh, radiologists are poised to take a prominent role in the ongoing discourse about incorporation of AI into clinical practice is what I believe. And there are, um, in the future, there are um, opinions that uh, if AI lives up to its potential, breast imaging radiologists could have more time to pursue the more personally and professionally fulfilling aspects of their jobs, including patient interaction, collaboration with colleagues and teaching of trainees. This is a quote from uh, Dr. Smetherman who uh, brought on the economic impact of AI on breast imaging and JVI. Um, I, I think that could very much happen, but um, it's all about how we uh, implement it. I wanna thank all of my research team here and um, I we wouldn't have generated our data without their invaluable help, and also point that uh, a new really good summary that we published on this topic in JBI. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that awesome lecture, Dr. Duan, and we will open up the floor for any questions folks have, and if you could submit those through the Q&A feature, that would be great. Um, we've got one in there now. Um, did AI decrease the workload for prediction or does it increase the workload? So um, with prediction, uh, I understand that, so when you say prediction, I guess my that question would be, would that be prediction of 
versus malignant, or would this be prediction of um, future risk of the patient? So for future risk assessment um, of breast cancer risk, um, I think we might consider that it, it may increase the workload of the in that uh, if the if we the patient is uh, average risk and you know, we're thinking that the patient's risk prediction increases, then we can expect to see more um, additional imaging or supplemental screening or MRI, ultrasound, et cetera, for those patients. But if we are um, talking about benign versus malignant classification, um, it's predicted to decrease it because the idea is to really not look at those ones that are predicted as zero at chance of malignancy by AI at all, just like the workflow I showed that we have here in UT Southwestern. I actually have a question. The um, That patient slide you had about folks not feeling super comfortable getting a report uh, using AI, is there something to be done with helping folks be more comfortable with that? Is it patient education? Is it attending more lectures like these, what what is what is something that could make patients feel a little more comfortable with this new landscape? Um, that's a good question. So we, in that study, and we also did a study here uh, in our center as well, it seems that the higher the patient's education, uh, there, there is an increase in uh, trusting or uh, relying more on AI. So whether that's um, whether that's relevant to uh, a higher interaction with AI or not in their daily lives, um, you know that's that's a question we didn't ask and they didn't ask in that study either. But uh, patient education seems to be one factor, and um, here in our uh, data set, we found that uh, patient race did play a role. Um, with um, non-Hispanic African-American patients and um, Hispanic patients showing um, more um, of distrust towards AI than um, non-Hispanic white patients. So, so there are a lot of factors that play into this, but um, maybe it is patient education and it could be that uh, sometimes patients interaction with AI are not positive at all in daily life. And they think that's when it was going to happen here. Mm. Yeah, interesting. I'm I'm curious to see how this evolves as, as it's become implemented. Other component of that, sorry to interrupt you, is they don't want to lose their interaction with the doctor. That's a big um, mm. factor in the patients not wanting to just interact with the AI because that interaction is very valuable to them. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you. Do you have any experience in using AI and mammography with genetical tests as a predictor of risk? Or what is your opinion about that? That's a good question. We haven't done that. We don't have that uh, software I showed in my talk, but I believe it has now been made available into a commercially available product um by the group that developed it but we don't have that implemented here does your practice currently allow ai negative readings to not be reviewed by a radi radiologist we don't because uh the regulations don't allow for that at this time so how is this going to play out is really it's going to be very very interesting in the future because um of the liability situation. We don't know who is to take the liability for a for wrong AI interpretation or a wrong AI recall. So uh, at this time, we are basically using it as a second reader. Um, but uh, there, I think there's implementation in Europe, actually, for, to that effect, because it, they are doing double reading and uh, they're really, really behind on screening reading. And uh, their payment model is based on that double reading. So, uh, because it uncalls the, the their call rate back rates are kept really, really low, much lower than average American rates. So, 
they have uh, they can maintain their um, national mammography uh, programs where they offer it to everybody. So in, in the US, it's opportunistic mammography screening, as you know. So uh, with them, actually, I think a lot of them are thinking about going live with uh, AI reading and only having uh, the, the positive or abnormal ones being looked at by the radiologist because they're really behind and backlogged and there's really not a whole lot of breast radiologists in the pipeline being trained. So um, I think that's the situation there. So we may see it roll out in Europe before it does in the U US. Gotcha. Let's say the AI gets something wrong. How do you rectify it or retrain it to correct itself in the future for any other case it might see? So at the time we receive um, the AI model, it's actually locked. So because, you know, I told you about the model drift and model drift can occur even after being locked, but um, the, the, the changes and, you know, the additional developments in the, in the model is not allowed. So that's both a good thing and a bad thing. It's a, it's a, it's a good thing because you know what to expect, but it's a bad thing because, um, I mean, it would not be bad for you to actually train it on your own data set and make sure it performs better in your own data set, but that's not currently allowed uh, because FDA requests that from the vendors. So in answer to your question, I don't, we can't really improve or change uh, commercial models um, performance. We can, we might be able to do it without commercialization. If we have a homegrown model that we're using, um, it might be possible, but um, it, it's not possible for a commercial model at this time. Gotcha. All right. I think we're going to wrap up today's noon conference. Thank you all for participating in our noon conference and asking such great questions. You can access the recording of today's conference and all our previous noon conferences by creating a free MRI online account. We'll also email out a link to the replay later today. Be sure to join us next week on August 22nd at 12 p.m. Eastern, where Dr. Reed Omori will deliver a lecture entitled Radiology's Opportunity to Benefit Patients and the Planet. You can register for that at mrionline.com and follow us on social media for updates on future new conferences. Thanks again for learning with us and have a great day.